Hello, and hello to our audiences near and far. We welcome you to Mechanics Institute's annual Bloomsday Celebration. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events. Our Bloomsday Noon is co-sponsored by the Consulate General of Ireland, San Francisco, the National Library of Ireland, Dublin, and Gray Area, San Francisco. First, we are honored to have Robert O'Driscoll, Council General of Ireland of the Western United States, who has a special greeting for us. Please listen. Ahorja, Aginushla, friends, distinguished guests. Um, my name is Robert O'Driscoll. I'm Ireland's Consul General here in San Francisco, and I'm delighted to have been invited by the Mechanics Institute once again to address you at the start of your Bloomsday celebrations. I want to pay particular tribute to, to Laura and her team there at the Mechanics Institute. I know they've had to move everything online, but uh, I want to praise your, your, your ambition uh, and your creativity. I know today you've got a full uh, program of recitals and uh, musical and theatrical performances, which I think are really going to bring alive Bloomsday. And, and rest assured, you're in good company. There is uh, events on here, of course, in San Francisco, um, but also all across the world. Gloom Bloomsday is a global celebration. It is it is an Irish writer and James Joyce, an Irish set in Dublin in my own my own home city. Um, but it has global significance uh, and you are part of that global Irish community uh, here today. The, I think that the fact that we're able to gather in this fashion would have appealed to Joyce. He was a man of ideas, a man of creativity who loved the use of uh, technology to make things possible. Um, and in many ways, the use of technology, in particular Zoom, being able to move from person to person, from face to face, to hear all these different voices is very reminiscent of certain chapters of, uh, of Ulysses, when we're introduced to all these different characters and all their different uh, perspectives. Ulysses is a kind of an early attempt at multimedia communications, which are the heart of our attempts to stay connected today, even though we are far apart. Although I think it's important to remember, um, to remember what Joyce said. He said, real adventures do not happen to people at stay at home. Uh, who remain at home, they must be sought abroad. So while this is a great celebration and I'm happy to do this way today, I hope it isn't long uh, before we can all leave our homes and have real adventures and meetups uh, together. Ulysses is probably one of the most famous examples of modernist literature uh, where the past is rethought and the future is charted out in the wake of upheaval and societal change. It's a time when new energies were coming to fruition. It is reminiscent of today, and of some of the changes we are experiencing right now in this moment. And in this regard, Ulysses humanity remains its luster, maintains its luster. Joyce's efforts to bridge gaps, to understand others and to share with them, with them your own story as demonstrated in this wonderful, important novel are inspiring. Its fundamental message of coexistence and the inherent values of other people's views is one which is so relevant always, but perhaps particularly so today. In conclusion, uh, I want to thank you again for having me here. I want to wish you well in your performances today. I want to say kagorgicus again to everyone for making this happen. I want to wish you all a very happy Bloomsday. Ganyari and Thank you, Consul General Robert O'Driscoll. Now today, we bring together two worlds. That of James Joyce's novel, Ulysses, set on June 16th, 1904, and today. And today merging old and new, virtual and real, in a time of peace and unrest, illness and health. Our Bloomsday Noon, a performance montage, features readings, music and song by performers from the Bay Area, New York and Ireland. Our video runs 65 minutes and features 16 interpretations of Joyce's writing and themes that are traditional, contemporary and experimental including portrayals of characters and scenes from Ulysses, many staged from home on Zoom, plus well-known Irish songs and a new musical compositions. We begin with a Gaelic tribute and incantation, Cuach an Puka, In Between Two Worlds by jazz singer Melanie O'Reilly. Enjoy. Oh. 
Chuat Kansiri, Chuat La Rawa, Chuat La Straka, Chuat La Bacha, Chuat La Fuisha, Chuat La Haran, Chuat La Brecha, Chuat Kantu Da Gael. Chuat La Mela, Chuat La Trecha, Chuat La Kahu, Chuat La Laska, Chuat La Tlipa, Chuat La Nela, Chuat La Plesha, Chuat La Damsa. Shadrolling of Fura Savar at Lila, Goyam Narvari and Alti Dor, I read the Dig of Turton and Yach, the Kuri made trolling him as the Kus, Shadrolling of Fura Sains of Kurak, Vishayam Harakas Chakas and Maka, Vaik she shoes of his Pushak, Vakshay a drink of the Makshay Turshak. Diddly I don't that, 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 if I'm young still. Can I? It's a wonder I'm not an old shriveled hag before my time, living with him so cold, never embracing me, except sometimes when he's asleep, the wrong end of me, not knowing, I suppose, who he has. Any man that kiss a woman's bottom, I'd throw my hat at him. After that, he'd kiss anything unnatural, where we haven't one atom of any kind of expression in us. All of us the same, two lumps of lard, before ever I do that to a man. Pooh, the dirty brutes, the mere thought is enough. I was thinking, would I go around by the keys there, some dark evening, where nobody'd know me, and pick up a sailor off the sea, that would be hot on for it, and not care a pin whose I was. Only do it off up in a gate somewhere. Or one of those wild-looking gypsies in Rathfarnham had their camp pitched near the Bloomfield Laundry to try and steal our things if they could. I only sent mine there a few times for the name. Model Laundry. Sending me back over and over some old one's odd stockings. That blackguard-looking fella with the fine eyes peel and a switch, attack me in the dark and ride me up against the wall without a word or a murderer, anybody, what they do themselves. 
I don't care what anybody says. It'd be much better for the world to be governed by the women in it. You wouldn't see women going and killing one another and slaughtering. When do you ever see women rolling around drunk like they do or gambling every penny they have and losing it on horses? Yes, because a woman, whatever she does, she knows where to stop. Sure, they wouldn't be in the world at all. Only for us. They don't know what it is to be a woman and a mother. How could they? Where would they, all of them, be if they hadn't all a mother to look after them? What I never had. That's why I suppose he's running wild now, out at night, away from his books and studies, and not living at home, on account of the usual rowy house, I suppose. Well, it's a poor case that those that have a fine son like that, they're not satisfied. And I none. Was he not able to make one? It wasn't my fault. We came together when I was watching the two dogs up in her behind in the middle of the naked street. That disheartened me altogether. I suppose I oughtn't to have buried him in that little woolly jacket I knitted crying as I was, but give it to some poor child. But I knew well I'd never have another. Our first death, too, it was. We were never the same since. Oh, I'm not going to think myself into the glooms about that any more. Breakfast, take four. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, mmm, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, <gasps> fried hen cod rose, but most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. <laughs> kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Gilded light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere <laughs> made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter, three, four, right? She didn't like her plate full, right? He turned away from the tray, lifted the kettle off the hob, and set it sideways on the fire. A cup of tea soon. <laughs> Good mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round a leg of the table with tail on high. Meow. Oh, there you are. The cat mewed in answer and stalked again stiffly round a leg of the table, meowing. <laughs> Just how she stalks over my writing table. Prr, scratch my head. Prr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the leaf black form cling to see, the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees, milk for the pussins? The cat cried. They call them stupid. 
They understand what we say better than we understand them. Hmm? Oh, she understands all she wants to. Vindictive too, cruel her nature. Curious mice never squeal, seem to like it. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower. <laughs> no, she can jump me. On quietly creaky boots. He went up the staircase to the hall, paused by the bedroom door. Oh, she might like something tasty. Thin bread, butter she likes in the morning. Still, perhaps, once in a way. I'm going round the corner. Be back in a minute. You don't want anything for breakfast. A sleepy, soft grunt answered. Mm, mm, mm. He heard then a warm, heavy sigh, softer as she turned over, and the loose brass quoits of the bedstead jingled. His hand took his hat from the peg over his initialed heavy coat. The sweated legend in the crown of his hat told him mutely, Plasto's high grada. He peeped quickly inside the leather headband. White slip of paper, quite safe. On the doorstep, he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key. <gasps> Not there. Oh, in that trousers I left off. Must get it. Oh, no use disturbing her. She turned over sleepily that time. He pulled the hall door to after him very quietly, more to the foot lift, dropped gently over the threshold, a limp lid. Hmm, looked shut. All right, till I come back anyhow. Ulysses is a notoriously complex book. It gives us the Dublin of 1904 in radically strange and challenging ways. Through its reworking of style and form, the novel engages critically with the world it presents. It asks us to grapple with the issues faced by the city, issues of colonialism, capitalism, technology, questions of gender and race. The novel thus speaks to our concerns today as it tells its story in devious, polytropic ways. You've just heard Leopold Bloom's first comic appearance in the novel, as he displays his curious taste for kidneys and giblets. Bloom here is both a modern version of a Homeric warrior who burns pieces of flesh in tribute to the gods, and also a modern oddity, valuing cuts of meat that are considered awful, but falls off as waste. Bloom, like the novel as a whole, comes up with his own values and his own ways of doing things. Throughout the day in which Ulysses is set, the day we call of Bloom's Day, Bloom responds to a series of problems, social injustice and poverty, unfair distributions of labor and wealth, casual prejudice, and pointed bigotry. These problems of identity and meaning in a world where all traditional scripts are in question are worked through in Bloom's relationship with Molly. On this very day, she sleeps with blazes boiling. Her adultery raises the question of love in the modern world. What is marriage? What, if any, control does a man have over a woman? One of Bloom's responses is to remember the moment Molly agreed to marry him. It is this memory that sustains Bloom and sustains the reader throughout the wanderings of Bloom's day. Indeed, Molly herself remembers this event in the last pages of the novel. I'm going to read that passage for you now. Sitting in a bar, Bloom remembers the picnic he and Molly had on Holt Head where they lay under rhododendrons and looked out over Dublin Bay. In our time of quarantine and of strict limits on physical closeness to the domestic unit, their physical intimacy is all the more striking. 
It's also a stylistically creative passage. Its unusual word orderings create a sense of the erosion of boundaries between Molly and Bloom. Subjects, objects, and verbs merge into one another as their bodies melt together. In our moment of separation and estrangement, their erotic mingling is a moment of inspiration and hope. Glowing wine on his palate lingered, swallowed, crushing in the wine press grapes of burgundy. Sun's heat it is, seems to a secret touch, telling me memory. Touched, his sense moistened, remembered. Hidden under wild ferns on hoof, below a space sleeping, sky, no sound. The sky, the bay purple by lion's head, green by drumlek, yellow green towards Sutton, fields of undersea, the faint lines brown and grass, buried cities. Pillowed under my coat, she had her hair, earwigs in the heather scrub, my hand under her nape. You'll toss me all. Oh, wonder. Cool, soft with ointments, her hand touched me, caressed. Her eyes upon me did not turn away. Ravished over her I lay, full lips open, kissed her mouth, yum. Softly she gave me in my mouth the seed cake. Warm and chewed, mawkish pulp, her mouth had mumbled sweet sour of her spittle. Joy. I ate it, joy. Young life, her lips that gave me pouting, soft, warm, sticky, gum jelly lips. Flowers her eyes were, take me, willing eyes. Pebbles fell, she lay still, a goat, no one. High on Ben Hoth rhododendrons, a nanny goat walking sure-footed, dropping currants. Screened under ferns, she laughed, Warm folded. Wildly I lay on her, kissed her, eyes, her lips, her stretched neck beating, woman's breasts full in her blouse of nuns veiling, fat nipples upright, hot I tongued her. She kissed me, I was kissed. All yielding she tossed my hair, kissed, she kissed me, me, me now. In the merry month of June, from my home I started, left the girls of two. Nearly broken hearted, saluted father dear, kissed me darling mother, drank a pint of beer. Tears and grief to smother, off to reap the corn, leave where I was born. I cast out black heart to banish ghosts and goblin in a brand new pair of robes, wrapped to lower the bogs, frightened all the dogs on the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five, cut the hair and turn her down the rocky road, all the way to Dublin, back for old Iraq. In Mullingar that night, I rested limb so weary, started by daylight, born and blithe and airy, took a drop of the pure, keep my heart from sinking, that's an Irishman's cure, when he's on for drinking, to see the lassie smile, laughing all the while, at me curious style, twould set your heart a bubbling, axed if I was hired, wages I required, I was almost tired of the rocky road to Dublin, one, two, three, four, five, Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road All the way to Dublin, whack full old Iraq In Dublin next arrived, I thought it such a pity To be soon deprived of you of that fine city Took myself a stroll out amongst the quality Bundle it was stole in a neat locality Something crossed my mind, then I looked behind No bundle I could find upon me, stick. Wobbling. 
Inquiring for the rogue, they said my conic brogue wasn't much in vogue on the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road all the way to Dublin. Whack full old Iraq. From there I got away, spirits never failing, landed on the quay. As the ship was sailing, captain let me roar, said that no room had he. When I jumped on board, a cabin found for Paddy, down amongst the pigs, and some hearty jigs, sang some hearty reeds. Water round me bubbling, went off Molly head, I wished myself was dead. Better pour instead on the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road. All the way to Dublin, whack full old Iraq. The boys of Liverpool, when we safely landed, called myself a fool. I could no longer stand it. Blood began to boil, temper I was losing. Poor old Aaron's Isle, they began abusing. Hurrah, my soul, says I, shall lay the island fly. The way boys nearby could see I was a hobbling with a loud hooray. Joined in the affray, help me clear the way for the rock. To Dublin, one, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road. All the way to Dublin. Whack for old Iraq. Bloom was talking and talking with John Wise, and uh, he was quite excited with his dunduckety mud colored mug on him and his old plum eyes rolling about. Oh, thank you. Oh. Uh, Persecution. All the world is full of it. Perpetrate national hatred among nations. What do you know what a nation means, says John Wise. Yes. What is it? A nation, a nation is the same people living in the same place. <laughs> Be good, says Ned, laughing. If that's so, I'm a nation, for I've been living in the same place for the past five years. So, of course, everybody had a laugh at Bloom, and says he, trying to muck out of it, well, also living in different places. What is your nation, if I may ask, says the citizen? Ireland. I was born here, in Ireland. The citizen said nothing. Only cleared the spit out of his gullet and gob. He spat a red bank oyster out of him right into the corner. After you with the post, Joe says, he taken out his handkerchief to swab himself dry. There you are, citizen, says Joe. Take that in your right hand and repeat after me the following words. The much treasured and intricately embroidered ancient Irish face cloth attributed to Solomon of Drama and Manus Tamiltak, Og MacDonough, authors of the Book of Ballymote. Ah, show us over the drink. Which one is which? Oh, oh that one's mine. <clears throat> As the dead um, said to the dead policeman. <laughs> and I belong to a race that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant, robbed, plundered, insulted, persecuted, taken what belongs to us by right at this very moment, sold by auction in Morocco like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem, says the citizen. I'm talking about injustice. Right, says John Wise. Stand up to it. Then, with force, like men, 
but it's no use. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women, insult and hatred. And everybody knows that it's the very opposite that is really life. What, says John Wise? Love. I mean the opposite of hatred. A new apostle to the Gentiles, says the citizen. Universal law. Well, isn't that what we're told? Love your neighbor. That chap, says the citizen. Beggar my neighbor is his motto. Love, Moya. Well, he's a nice pattern of a Romeo and Juliet. Love loves to love love. Nurse loves the chemist. Constable 14A loves Mary Kelly. Goethe McDowell loves the boy with the bicycle. MB loves a fire, gentlemen. Li Chi Han, lovey up, kissy, chow poo chow. <coughs> Jumbo the elephant loves. <coughs> Alice the elephant. Old Mr. Virchoil with the ear trumpet loves old Mrs. Virchoil with the Terridan eye. The man in the brown Macintosh loves a lady who is dead. His Majesty the King loves Her Majesty the Queen. Mrs. Norman W. Tupper loves a fair gentleman. Oh, you love a certain person. And that person loves that other person. Because everybody loves somebody. But God. God loves everybody. Everybody. widower now. I wonder what sort is his son. He says he's an author and going to be a professor of Italian and I'm to take lessons. I wonder what is he driving at now, showing him my photo. It's not good of me. I ought to have gotten it taken in drapery. That never looks out of fashion. Still, I look young in it. I wonder he didn't make him a present of it, and me too. After all, why not? I suppose he's a man now by this time. He was such a darling little fellow in his Lord Fauntleroy suit and curly hair, like a prince on the stage. When I saw him at Mac Dillon's, he liked me too, I remember. They all do. Wait. By God, yes, wait. Hold on, he was in the cards this morning when I laid out the deck. Union with a young stranger, neither dark nor fair. I thought it meant him, but he's no chicken, neither a stranger neither. Besides, my face was turned the other way. What was the seventh card after that? The ten of spades for a journey by land. Then there was a letter on its way, and scandals too, 
the, the three queens and the eight of diamonds for a rise in society. Yes, it all came out. And two red eights for new garments. Look at that. And didn't I dream something too? There was something about poetry in it. I hope he hasn't long, greasy hair hanging into his eyes or standing up like a red Indian. What did they go about like that for? Only getting themselves and their poetry laughed at. I always liked poetry when I was a girl. First I thought he was a poet like Byron, not an ounce of it in his composition. I thought he was quite different. I wonder, is he too young? He's probably 20 or more. <laughs> I'm not too old for him if he's 23 or 24. <laughs> I hope he's not that stuck up university student sort. They all write about some woman in their poetry. Well, I suppose he won't find many like me. Where softly sighs of love the light guitar where there's poetry in the air, the blue sea and the moon shining so beautifully, coming back in the night boat from Tarifa, the lighthouse at Europa Point, the guitar that fellow played was so expressive. Will I never go back there again? All new faces, two glancing eyes, a lattice hid. I'll sing that for him. They're my eyes, if he's anything of a poet. Two eyes as darkly bright as love's own star. <laughs> Aren't those beautiful words? As love's own star. That'll be a change, the Lord knows. To have someone intelligent to talk to about yourself. I'm sure he's very, very distinguished. I'd like to meet a man like that. God knows, not those other rook. Besides, he was young. Those fine young men I could see down at Margate Strand bathing place from the side of the rock. Standing up in the sun, naked like a god or something, and then plunging into the sea with them. Oh, God. Now, wouldn't that be some consolation for a woman? Like that lovely little statue he bought. I could look at him all day long. His curly hair and shoulders. His finger up for you to listen. There's real beauty and poetry for you. I often felt... I wanted to kiss him all over. Also, his lovely young cock there so simply. I wouldn't mind taking him in my mouth if nobody was looking. As if he was asking you to suck it. So clean and white he looked with his boyish face. I would too, in half a minute, even if some of it went down. It's only like Gruel or the Jew that there's no danger. Besides, he'd be so clean compared to those pigs of men. I suppose never dream of washing it from one year's end to the other. The most of them. Sure, that's what gives the women the moustaches. I'm sure it'll be grand if only I can get in with a handsome young poet at my age. I'll throw the cards first thing in the morning till I see if the wish card comes out. Or I'll try pairing the lady herself to see if he comes out. I'll read or study all I can find and if I know what he likes I'll learn it off by heart so he doesn't think I'm stupid and I can teach him the other part. I'll make him feel oh all oh, beautiful under me. Then he'll write about me lover and mistress publicly too with our two photographs in all the papers when he becomes famous <laughs> mm. 
Mr. Bloom walked unheeded along his grove by saddened angels, crosses, broken pillars, family vaults, stone hopes praying with upcast eyes, old Ireland's hearts and hands. It's more sensible to spend the money on some charity for the living. Pray for the repose of the soul of, does anybody really? Plant him and have done with him, like down a coal chute, then lump them together to save time. All Souls Day. 27th I'll be at his grave. 10 shillings for the gardener. Keeps it free of weeds. The old man himself, bent on double with his shears clipping, near death's door. Who passed away? Who departed this life as if they did it of their own accord? Got the shove, all of them. Who kicked the bucket? It's, it's more interesting if they told you what they were. So and so, wheelwright. I traveled for the Cork Lino. I paid five shillings in the on pound. Or a woman with her saucepan. I cooked good Irish stew. Eulogy in a country churchyard, it ought to be. That uh, poem of, uh, who's it? Wordsworth, or uh, Thomas Campbell. Entered into rest, the Protestants put it. Old Dr. Murrins, the great physician called him home. Well, it's God's acre for them. It's a nice country residence. Well, newly plastered and painted. The ideal spot to have a quiet smoke and read the church times. Eh, marriage ads, they never try to beautify. Rusty wreaths hung on knobs, garlands of bronze foil. Better value that for the money. Still, the flowers are more poetical. The others get rather tiresome, never withering, expressing nothing. Immortals. A bird sat tamely perched on a poplar branch, like stuffed. Like the wedding present Alderman Hooper gave us. Who, who? Not a budge out of him. Knows there are no catapults to let fly at him. That's a dead animal, even sadder. Silly Millie burying the little dead bird in the kitchen matchbox. A daisy chain and bits of broken chainies on the grave. No, oh, sacred heart, that is. Showing it. Heart on his sleeve. Yeah, it ought to be sideways in red. It should be painted like a real heart. Ireland was dedicated to it, or whatever that. Seems anything but pleased. Why this infliction? Would birds come then and peck like the boy with the basket of fruit, but he said no because they ought to have been afraid of the boy? Apollo, that was. Ah, how many. All these here once walked round Dublin. Faithful departed. As you are now, so once were we. Tim Finnegan lived in Walken Street, a gentleman Irish mighty odd. He had a brogue both rich and sweet, and to rise in the world he carried a hod. You see, he'd a sort of a tippling way, with a love for the liquor he was born. And to set him on his way each day, he'd a drop of the crater every morn. Back from the dark with the dance to heart, roll down the floor, your trotter sheep. One day when Tim was rather full, his head felt heavy which made him shake. He fell off the ladder and he broke his skull, and they brought him home his corpse to wake. Rolled him up in a nice clean sheet, laid him out upon the bed, with a bottle of whiskey at his feet and a barrel of porter at his head. 
wife of the dog when you danced your partner on the floor, your tractor shake. Isn't it the truth? I told you lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. But his friends assembled at the wake, and Mrs. Finnegan called for brunch. But first she brought out tea and cake, then pipes, tobacco, and whiskey punch. Then the widow Malone began to cry. Such a nice clean corpse did you ever see? Tim, afraid, why did you die? Will you hold your gob, says Molly McGee. Whack for the dog, you danced your heart, on the floor, your truck, your shit. Isn't it the truth that told you lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake? Well, Mary Murphy took up the job. Oh, Biddy, says she, you're wrong, I'm sure. Then Biddy fetched her a belt in the gob and left her sprawling on the floor. Then the war did then engaged was woman to woman and man to man. Shalala la was all the rage and a row and eruption soon began. Whack on the dog when you danced your partner around the floor, your truck or shake. Isn't it the truth? I told you lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. Well, Mick Maloney ducked his head when a bottle of whiskey flew at him instead of landing on the bed. The whiskey scattered over Tim. Be dad revived, see how he rises. Timothy rising from the bed, saying, Throw my whiskey around like blazes. Panaman Duel, do you think I'm dead? Whack for the doll when you danced your partner around the floor, your truck was shake. Isn't it the truth? I told you lots of fun at Finnegan's Way. What is a ghost? Stephen said with tingling energy. One who has faded into impalpability through death, through absence, through change of manners. Elizabethan London lay as far from Stratford as corrupt Paris lies from virgin Dublin. Who is the ghost from Limbo Patrum returning to the world that has forgotten him? Who is King Hamlet? It is this hour of a day in mid-June. The flag is up on the playhouse by the bankside. The bear, Sackerson, growls in the pit near it. Paris Garden. Canvas climbers who sailed with Drake chew their sausages among the groundlings. Local color, working all you know make them accomplices. Shakespeare has left the Huguenot's house in Silver Street and walks by the Swan Mews along the riverbank. But he does not stay to feed the pen shivying her game of signets towards the rushes. The Swan of Avon has other thoughts. Composition of place. Ignatius Loyola, make haste and help me. The play begins. A player comes on under the shadow, made up in the cast off mail of a court buck, a well set man with a bass voice. It is the ghost, the king. studied Hamlet all the years of his life, which were not vanity in order to play the part of a specter. He 
he speaks the words to Burbage, the young player who stands before him beyond the rack of searcloth, calling him by name. Oh, Mitch, I am your father's spirit. Bidding him list to a son he speaks, the son of his soul, the prince, young Hamlet, and to the son of his body, Hamlet Shakespeare, who has died in Stratford, that his namesake may live forever. Is it possible that the player Shakespeare, a ghost by absence, and in the vesture of buried Denmark, a ghost by death, speaking his own words to his own son's name, had Hamlet Shakespeare lived, he would have been Prince Hamlet's twin. Is it possible, I want to know, or probable, that he did not foresee or draw the logical conclusion of these premises. You are the dispossessed son. I am the murdered father. Your mother is the guilty queen, Anne Shakespeare, born Hathaway. Art thou there, Drew Penny? We are entitled to memory, foam, and a summary scene at home. We are entitled to tie in Burmese and Laotian promotion of actual victuals anytime, night or day on the computer. One click and it's here in an hour of gases and plastic emission with somebody, somebody starving in contrary motion, escaping all over the ocean from bitter and battle and rubble of tattering, troubling, total deploying, destroying as we invent fission and fashion. And we are entitled to pompous privilege for college and pillaging. We are entitled to fill up the village of phallus, inflammable fortress of plundering, wandering, White and impervious Wellington, Washington, Waterloo, Wilmington, Wuthering, highly improbable, wondering whether in novels the avarice ever recovers. And why are we wallowing here in the bed with some pages on red? I am willing a shilling to Britain for taking a second election. Erection of asinine nationals, frightened of foreigners, seeking employment, asylum, survival, existence, a bite and a pillow, a roof and a fellow, compassionate, passionate, peripatetic, a mattress, a matter of memory, foam and a forgotten fiddle, or saddle or anything tenable, arable, wearable, fashion. Fishing, gone fishing, a future for father of someone in solitude. Gratitude, doddering, wasting away at the whim of the institute. What can I do for the dying who did for me everything, everything? Sing him a song at the end of the universe, hoping he'll hear it and summon a shiver of memory foam in his horrible home. It's the happiest one in the area, only it's odious, hideous. He is entitled to beauty, a banquet, a final of heavenly travel, examining languages, audible, edible, science of sonic, acoustical, coding, deciphering, foreign, deplorable. Seventy years in the seat of a secretive government numbering proud of his part of untelling intelligence keeping us ever entitled to not even think of it innocent imminent immigrant creepily speaking of spying and lying and tapping your telephone hell if he knew it but no point in asking it's better to let him be bigger for 70 years in the service of others it's more than i ever could say for myself all i did was some ranting and chanting that nobody heard except those who expected it how can you make any difference when you are in hiding and staying inside the absurdity wordity messing with morals and metaphor guessing the parts of meaning, morpheming, phoneming, phonology, elocute, elegy. Mention declension disclaimer, I'm yammering off at your grammar. I got pay, 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 p
to talk about art at the party And we are entitled to stalk at the party It's only one drink and that gives you permission to model The mission, the missing of muscle is making you move in a menacing manner I have no relation to this iteration But seemingly something to talk about other than art at the party And far more important is people are ravishing people and blowing up people And there goes another one mad at the masses attending the mosque Synagogue, how do you spell it? A god at the synagogue Coco and Dada that grew out of meaningless savage and people and blowing up people and bubbling up into art that is artifice Edifice passing is art in the room at the Philly Museum Where you and I snuck in the closet and massively made it surrounded by janitor thingies and darkness The opposite artness are all of my favorite pieces Inspired and fired by dim and murder Maybe it matters to many or maybe a few But it's back at the studio gathering evidence Studying reasons for trying to hear my surrealist hero Speaking of Europe, the lovely young couple who stayed at the house at the countries united way back in the 50s. I said, I don't think so, because I remember it. Suddenly piles of penniless paper, just pieces of art in the closet. I visited so many countries. They clutter together and check off the bucket. I've been there. Do you understand what the bucket? The bucket is death. We have some stupid picture of lying there thinking of places we never completed. I got pretty good with my Spanish and German and French if you're very forgiving. So living is all about grabbing a piece of the planet as long as you pay for your carbon emission. Your cultural comes at a cost And it's not as if going there benefits anyone stuck at the border But I am entitled to miles for using my credit card Double the points if it's dining or groceries What do you see if you're losing your vision? The ruins, the pyramids Going to Greece in the spring Gonna gaze at the scenery Seen in my inner ecstatic Entitled to sit in the therapist's office And talk to my organs Entitled to travel and finish the circle of birth and recycle I signed up my body for science at UCSF Is there anything else I can do more important than dying? I'm already famous for closing my eyes and discovering patterns I already had a good run with the man of my soul I'm supposedly holy Even though I am lacking some delicate layers of memory foam I am home in the studio striking at letters a little more Click, 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 Mm. God, we simply must dress the character. I want puce gloves. You're a student, weren't you? Of what in the other devil's name? P C N. P point C point N point. You know. Physique, chimique, et naturel. Aha! Eating your goat's worth of mouan sive. Flesh pots of Egypt, elbowed by belching cabmen. Just say in the most natural tone. When I was in Paris, boulmiche, I used to. Huh, Yes, used to carry punch tickets to prove an alibi if they arrested you for murder somewhere. Justice. On the night of the 17th of February, 1904, the prisoner was seen by two witnesses. Other fellow did it. Other me. Hat, tie, overcoat, nose. <coughs> Lui, c'est moi. You seem to have enjoyed yourself. Oh. Proudly walking. Whom were you trying to walk like? Oh, forget. A dispossessed. With mother's money, eight shillings, the banging door of the post office slammed in your face by the usher. Hunger toothache. Encore deux minutes. Look, clock. Must get fermé. Hired dog. Shoot him to bloody bits with a bang shotgun. Bits man splattered walls all brass buttons. Bits a kerclack in place. Clack back. Uh, not hurt. Oh, that's all right. Shake hands. See what I meant? See? Oh, that's all right. Shake a shake. Oh, that's only all right. You are going to work wonders. What? A missionary of Europe? 
after fiery Columbanus, Fiacre, and Scotus in their creepy stools, in heaven spilt from their pint pots, loud Latin laughing, you gay, <laughs> you gay, pretending to speak broken English as you dragged your valise, port of three pence, across the slimy pier at New Haven. <laughs> Comment? Rich booty you brought back. Le tutu, five tattered numbers of pantalon blanc et culotte rouge. A French telegram. Curiosity show. Mother dying, come home. Father. The aunt thinks you killed your mother. That's why she won't. So, there's health to Bulligan's aunt, and I'll tell you the reason why. She always kept things decent in the Hannigan family. Hmm. His feet marched in sudden proud rhythm over the sand furrows, along by the boulders of the south wall. He stared at them proudly. Piled stone mammoth skulls, gold light on sea, on sand, on boulders. The sun is there, the slender trees, the lemon houses. Hmm. Paris, rawly waking, crude sunlight on her lemon streets, moist pith of farls of bread, the fog green wormwood, her matin incense court the air. Balwomo rises from the bed of his lover's wife's lover. The kerchiefed housewife is astir, a saucer of ascetic acid in her hand. In Rodos, Yvonne and Madeleine new make their tumbled beauties, shattering with gold teeth chausson of pastry, their mouth yellowed by the pu of flan breton. <laughs> Faces of Paris men go by, their well-pleased pleasers, curled conquistador. I love flowers. I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. God in heaven, there's nothing like nature. The wild mountains, then the sea and the waves rushing, then the beautiful country with its fields of oats and wheat and all kinds of things. And all the fine cattle going about that would do your heart good to see. Rivers and lakes and flowers, all sorts of shapes and smells and colors springing up even out of the ditches. Primroses and violets, nature it is. As for them saying that there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't they go and create something? I often asked him, atheists, or whatever they call themselves, go and wash the cobbles off themselves first. Then they go howling for the priest, and they dying. And why? Why? Because they're afraid of hell, on account of their bad conscience. Ah, yes, I know them well. Who was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it all? Who? Ah, uh, that they don't know. Neither do I, so there you are. They might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. The sun shines for you, he said. The day we were lying among the rhododendrons on Howth Heath in the grey tweed suit and his straw hat. The day I got him to propose to me. Yes. First I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth. And it was a leap year like now. Yes. Sixteen years ago, my God, after that long kiss I near lost my breath. Yes. 
He said I was a flower of the mountain. Yes. So we are all flowers. All a woman's body. Yes. That was the one true thing he said in his life. And the sun shines for you today. Yes. That was why I liked him. Because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is. And I knew I could always get round him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could. Leading him on till he asked me to say yes. And I wouldn't answer first only looked out over the sea and the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and Father and old Captain Groves and the sailors playing and the sentry in front of the governor's house with the thing round his white helmet. Poor devil half roasted and the Spanish girls laughing in their tall combs, and their auctions in the morning, and the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who else from all the ends of Europe, and Duke Street, and the foul market all clucking outside Larby Sharon's, and the poor donkey slipping half asleep, and the vague fellas in the cloaks asleep on the shades and the big and wheel of the carts of the bulls and the castle thousands of years old yes and those handsome moors all in white and turbans like kings asking you to sit down in their little bit of a shop and the night we missed the boat at Algeciras the watchman going about serene with this lamp and that awful deep down torrent oh and the sea the sea crimson sometimes like fire and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees in the alameda gardens yes and all the queer little streets and the pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamines and the geraniums and the cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl where I was a flower of the mountain yes and how he kissed me under the moorish wall and I thought well as well him as another. Then I asked him with my eyes to ask again. Yes. And then he asked me, would I? Yes. To say yes. And my first and flower. Put my arms around him. Yes. And drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume. Yes! And his heart was going like mad. And yes! I said yes! I will! Yes!
welcome back and thank you for joining us at Bloomsday through Mechanics Institute. And much thanks again to Gray Area for our co-sponsorship, Consul General of Ireland, San Francisco, and to all of our community partners as well, as well as the National Library of Ireland. And I want to bring up our cast and have a, a cast curtain call for you. So bravo and bravo. Uh, cast, would you put yourself on video and, and uh, on mute to say hello to everybody? Hello from New York City, hello. Yes, we have Aaron, Aaron and Karen. Hi. Uh, from New York. Thank you right for a there. lovely show. Aaron Beal, who's a for aren't you a former Berkeleyan? Yeah, I went to Maybeck, I went to Berkeley High, I went to El Cerrito High, and then I went to like five high schools in San Francisco, <laughs> all in two years. Great. And uh, Karen O'Brien is a, is a longtime uh, Bloomsday producer in New York, so we're just thrilled to have you as part of our, our Bloomsday, our, our Bloomies team. Thank um, you. It's a great show. Thank you. And I want to start at the top. Here's Esther Mulligan uh, and John Illion, our singers and actors uh, who were featured today from East Bay. A word for our uh, audiences. Um, can you see us, Laura? Yes, we can okay, see Okay, good. You. Wonderful. Um, well, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you, Laura, for, ha uh, for having us be part of this. And we, it was a wonderful program. And I just wanted to say hello to my family and friends in Ireland and to my family here. And um, that's it. John the same. My husband, John. <laughs> Glad to be a part of it. Uh, hello, all Bloomies out there. <laughs> I hope you had a good time. And uh, again, I was delighted to be a part of this. Thank you. Great. Next, we have uh, Josiah Paul Hamus, who's been with us for a long time, also from East Bay, a wonderful actor. Uh, and director and playwright as well. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Laura and Bruce and everyone at Mechanics uh, for including me in this wonderful group of people who are so talented. I feel really humbled to be a part of it and thank you so much. You were all awesome. I loved watching your performances and, um, and the range. So thank you, Bruce and Laura for putting such an interesting um, uh, collection of pieces together. And uh, any friends and family out there, thank you so much for watching. And um, this was so fun to uh, be a part of, and it was fun to work with Bruce on figuring out how to act together on Zoom. So that was really uh, quite fun. Yeah, thanks again. Yes, one of the challenges, of course, was doing a scene with a, 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 a a dialogue, but having to film in two different places and then to merge their scenes together. So everything you see was done from everyone's living rooms. <laughs> and of course, we have Bruce Spearman, our director, and uh, my colleague and collaborator on many theater projects, both with the Yiddish Theater Ensemble and other events that we're doing. And uh, Bruce is also an actor, a director, and a creator and a dance master, a Jewish dance master. So Bruce Bierman. Yeah, this was such an honor to be a part of this cast. Oh my God. Um, just L'Chaim from Leopold Bloom and <laughs> <laughs> And thank you all for joining us together. What a, what a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, and then we have Shout Melanie out from Mark Faulkner for all the hours of editing. Mwah. <laughs> yeah, so here's Mark Faulkner, our audio and visual editor from Bohanti Productions, uh, who we know from back to Boston and also to the Bay Area. And thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Uh, it was a pleasure to be able to do this and present, and uh, thanks to the tireless efforts of you, Laura, and Bruce, and Matthew, everybody at Gray Area. Thank you and kudos. Yes, and here's uh, Anne Guess, uh, who is our featured uh, music director, put all that wonderful music together uh, from her home and all of those wonderful songs with all the inlays of photos and 
you know, the, the camera with the piano and the flute and the, everything, all the wonderful details. And here's the piano. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you to Gray Area and to uh, Consul Driscoll for his remarks. I think James Joyce would have been just so excited to see what we did with all these different types of media. I was blown away. Thank you, Amy. That was amazing watching, wow, watching that. It really connected the, the book to me with what we're living through right now and what our world is going through. It was really, really amazing. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful to be a part of this. Next, we have Dan Harder, who is also an actor, uh, but mainly a poet and playwright and director. We've done many collaborations together, and thank you for bringing us to Paris for that Latin Quarter hat piece. That's a, it's a wonderful piece. It's a pleasure, vraiment. Uh, it was, uh, it's amazing to see how wonderfully you, everybody did. I had no idea, and I was asked, and I said, well, I'm not gonna be that good, and I probably wasn't all that great, but everybody was, the, the quilt that you put together um, would make Mr. Joyce very, very proud. Uh, it was really beautiful, and so I'm honored to be a part of it. And I just say to uh, friends um, and anybody else who's listening, à votre santé, à votre santé, comprenant dit. Um, yeah, be well. Thank you, Dan. All right, and of course we're welcoming Melanie O'Reilly from Wexford, Ireland, uh, one of our longtime bloomies and we're so happy to have you back melanie brought us those incredible opening uh, music selections with kuaram puka and i lose my breath uh, which was a beautiful way to follow up uh Karen's molly bloom but the music was just beautiful and um just so honored to have you back with us from afar oh. Thank you, Laura. It's absolutely fantastic to be reconnecting with you all, with the Bloomies, and with the new Bloomies now, with a new audience on Zoom. And it's been an honor and a pleasure to be part of this. I, it was always a pleasure and honor, but now with this new group and a new way of doing it, it was an amazing, uh, absolutely amazing event. And so it was fantastic to be part of that. And greetings from Ireland. And uh, so Dublin is my where I come from, but I'm actually here in Wexford, lockdown. <laughs> and so we're about to, of course, enter into um, the uh, new, um, shall we say, the restrictions will be lifted very soon where we can travel more. But um, I really want to say how incredibly well put together and Laura, Bruce, Mark, all of the team and all the uh, performances, it's, it was an extraordinary experience watching and listening and having this connection with Ulysses and now. And that's what James Joyce was all about, was the, the now and bringing the, the Liffey, you know, the, the stream running through it, bringing that all together. And I'm very, very proud to be part of it. And thank you so much for everything you've done. And thank um, you, Melanie. Yeah. I, I mean we included the wonderful, in the middle, we included those incredible photos from the uh, National Library of Ireland, and uh, which we were so pleased to be able to work with them, just to bring you to 1904 Ireland and, and to Dublin, and uh, that just brought us closer together, even though we we're, we're so far away from each other. Um, next, I want to introduce Amy X. Newberg, and uh, who's our uh, composer and vocalist and Andrew Uris, who did those incredible visuals and video for uh, the piece entitled. It, it, we was thrilling to see. And also we wanted to bring Joyce's stream of consciousness into today's artistry and expression. And Amy, I think that piece just hit it right on the head. It was just, just oh, amazing. Oh, good. Thank you. It was really um, an honor and an eye-opening experience to be part of this. I'm, I, I mean, I actually really learned a lot from watching this. And um, I'm now more in love with James Joyce than I was before. And I, I agree. I think he would have really approved of what we're doing here and, and our 
in our sort of modern capacity and limitations. And um, um, it was really fun to work with Andrew. He did, he, um, the, the piece actually existed beforehand, but um, a Andrew came on board very last minute once we became part of this uh, collection and, and worked very fast to put that video together. And I'm just, you know, thrilled that we were able to be part of it. And I'm st still in tears from that final soliloquy. It was very moving. So thank you all. Thanks, Amy. And, you know, thank you, Laura and Bruce, for putting us on. It was an amazing experience. Um, and it was just so quick and so last minute. And I, I remembered I read one page of Ulysses. And I, from what I understand, that's actually an accomplishment for a non-literate person. So I feel okay. proud of that. And maybe I'll get to page two. Thanks a lot. Thanks again. Okay, you have a, a, a 700 plus pages to go, but that's okay. Take your time. <laughs> Um, I also want to introduce uh, Professor Catherine Flynn, who gave us our professorial lecture uh, and a beautiful, beautiful reading uh, from uh, Playing Bloom. Um, and I also want to mention that um, Catherine is also head of the Irish Studies Department at UC Berkeley. And there's more to come. There's a whole other Bloomsday presentation and event that Catherine has produced at five o'clock today, and we're gonna put the link up on our chat. So please, we're all gonna join uh, Catherine at five o'clock, and I hope all of you will as well. Um, okay, have I introduced everybody? Um, I also wanna thank uh, Matthew Chacon from Gray Area. Um, can we see you, Matt? And also Pam Troy, events assistant at the Mechanics Institute for all of your uh, dedicated work behind the scenes. There was a lot, a lot to do today. And we, uh, we offer a salancha and uh, good health to everybody. And uh, we hope to see you in person next year and uh, be well, uh, stay connected. Um, we love you all and audience, thank you for joining us. Um, if you would like to make donations towards Bloomsday, just send that on to Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street, San Francisco, 94104, uh, or call us or email us and we'll be in touch with you. We're so proud to have our first international event with you and to bring together our performers and musicians and actors and cast members uh, with you, our audience, even though we're so far apart, uh, let's say a salancha together. Lancha. 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 Be well. <laughs>